Hey, good morning, everyone. Marty Mazzara here, second of December, twenty twenty-two, Friday, with your weekly economic update and with a quick stock market snapshot for you. In front of you is our PWA index, and folks continues to fall. We are falling deeper into our highest recession signal since we got there back in August of this year. And this just in, continues to tell us that odds are increasing by the week that we're going to have a recession in 2023. I've taken in as much of what I believe to be the objective smart commentary from other sources, some of them premium research that we subscribe to, others just well-known commentators, and seems to be very much the consensus that we're going to see a recession next year. The depth of the recession, the timing of the recession, the length of the recession, of course, that varies by commentator. Our take is that despite the still strong labor market, which was exhibited this morning, which I'll talk about in a second, that the recession happens first half of next year. Our take still remains that it will be relatively mild and that the second half of next year, as we see, for example, a good amount of infrastructure investment on both sides of the ocean, frankly, a concerted, I don't want to use the term desperate, but a very aggressive attempt on the part of China, both from a monetary and a fiscal policy standpoint, and from an opening up of COVID, which we've seen a quite dramatic change there over the last week or two as those demonstrations began to unfold, which it was a very interesting topic. Many people went to the place that they're just really gonna almost roll in the tanks, you know, in a 1989 style scenario. Our take was definitely not. Our take was that we are now entering a new age of populism globally, including China, and couple that with China's own ambitions, let's call them commercial ambitions, globally, a Tiananmen Square type situation, God forbid, is just not doable here. In fact, quite the opposite. In fact, the more people demonstrate, the more the Chinese leadership is going to want to open up ask people to take on more personal responsibility with regard to COVID, lessen, you know, the, in a big way, the draconian lockdowns when they happen. And we are seeing that literally daily, if not multiple times a day from top Chinese commentators, people very connected to the state, talking about opening up, talking about, for example, I follow the ex-editor of the Global Times, which is a essentially Chinese state media. And these folks don't get to say anything without the approval. And he tweeted this morning that he's 62 and a half years old and he's ready to get COVID. Um, and he needs to be willing to take the risks and so on. So just a dramatic turn with regard to the way China is approaching COVID these days. That is notably bullish course, as it has been the last few weeks for Chinese equities, but actually for the global economy into next year. But folks, it's also inflationary, right? We think that as the recession happens, per the data that we've seen lately, we think inflation continues to come off the boil. We think the 2% target is something that can certainly get touched on a year-over-year -year basis, but sustainable, no way in our view, not without just a crushing recession, which is not what we see right here. And we see then you know, inflation coming right back to the fore and the Fed having to maintain tighter policy for longer as we get into the latter stages of 2023 and beyond. And I won't get into this too much today. I've got to start thinking about the year end message this year, maybe somewhat like last year's, where we talk about the level of debt in the system and actually the benefit of inflation as being the only legitimate option to lower that debt as a percentage of the size of the economy. 
which is our 1940s analog that we've talked about here multiple times over the last couple of years. So more of that to come. In the meantime, a not good look uh, as it relates to the economy going forward. Let's take a look at a few of our inputs from this week, starting with auto sales. Uh, that was released this morning. Auto sales dropping a bit after a little bit of a rise. And this is as inventories have improved and so on and so forth. So not a good sign relative to the consumer. The savings rate dropping like a rock, 2.3%. Anecdotal evidence is that folks are pulling from savings, maybe even using credit cards to pay for even higher prices in the grocery aisle. So not a good look economically. The jobs data, as I mentioned on the, on the morning note, the freak out in the market today was really about the wage numbers being above expectations. In terms of the job numbers, yes, we were 36,000 more than expected at 263. Although we did get the prior month revised down by 23,000. And most of the beat here this month actually was in the government sector. Now the household survey, which is a separate survey, which is where we get the unemployment rate, they actually saw a uh, drop of 138,000 jobs. So, but the unemployment rate stayed the same. Well, frankly, that's because labor force participation dropped, right? The unemployment rate applies to people who are actively in the workforce, actively looking for jobs. If they leave the workforce or if they stop looking for jobs, that's the labor force participation rate that goes down. That actually serves as a headwind for the unemployment rate, meaning it would go down as people leave the workforce. Other things that came out this week and other reports worth noting is the quits rate. Quits rate continues to fall, right? It's still elevated by historical standards at 2.6. And the quit rate is just, you know, to the extent that people are just saying, see ya, I'm going to go work somewhere else. When it's high, that actually says positive things about the economy because people don't quit unless there's someplace else to go. So that's showing some weakness in the labor market. Uh, job opening still excessively high, but, you know, coming off the boil a little bit here. Powell talked a lot about that. So, you know, when you square it all up and you say, you know, government jobs, household survey down, labor force participation rate going down, that doesn't sound like a robust jobs numbers. So why is the market tanking today? Um, off of the bottom, but the S&P is still down 85 basis points. And then ASDAQ is down 1.36%. Uh, it's because of this, it's the wages. Wages were expected to come in at 4% and change. And they actually came in at 5.1% year over year and 0.55, which of course annualizes to more than that. And this is more important to look at on a monthly basis. And that folks is inflationary. And that's the concern of the Fed right here. And so that's why the market freaked out today is that, you know, here we have a Fed that really came in softer when you look at Powell's language, interesting debate around that. I don't quite understand it. A lot of people, I think people are just inherently bearish right now said that, you know, he didn't say anything differently. Gosh, I thought he said or implied or his inflection was a lot different than the last couple of speeches he gave. And it didn't surprise me. It surprised me that he came out that way, but it did not surprise me that the market gave that big positive reaction on Wednesday. But when you, when you square it all up, the Fed still is saying, that you know, we may not go 75 basis points, we're not going to in December, we're gonna stay at it until we get inflation down to our target. And which is what they're saying, I think until they break something or until we get in the first quarter and, and the economy really begins to roll over. Um, and then you see interest rates come down and I think they'll react relatively quickly, certainly after listening to Powell on Wednesday. But with this number and with the really strong stock market that we have of late, which is a loosening financial condition, it uh, wouldn't surprise me to see Fed speakers come back out and say, yeah, see, um, some of this data was one off here. We still have this wage data going up. We still have a lot more to do. And the market, I think, is getting, as I'm going to show you in the technical analysis in a minute, is getting out over its skis right here and is pushing at some really stiff overhead resistance Notwithstanding the strong seasonality, we still may do okay, at least into options expiration two weeks from today. Thereafter, I don't know. I think it's, um, we're in somewhat of a precarious spot right here. 
another thing that really supports our recession thesis is manufacturing ISM survey that was released yesterday came in in recessionary territory below 50. You can see that continues to plunge. That is an absolutely ominous sign. Um, I think it's Monday when the services component will come out. So we'll see how that, that one shows up as well. PCE came out, personal consumption expenditures. And the headline uh, down to 6.01. Core, which over here to the, to the left side is it, let's call it 5%. So that, you know, coming off the boil month over month. Headline 0.34. So again, this was welcomed by the market because you know it shows you know inflation coming off the boil, which is again we, what we expect more of if uh, if indeed the economy is going to continue to decline. Now I want to borrow from economist Peter Bookfar. We subscribe to his messaging, and he pointed out something that I missed this week. And that is um, an article from Market Watch, which quotes Vanguard that hardship withdrawals from 401ks are reaching all time highs. Here's from the story amid stubbornly high inflation, a record breaking share of Americans are turning their 401k accounts into emergency piggy banks, according to Vanguard. Dissecting data from a sample of the approximately 5 million employer sponsored 401ks that Vanguard handles. That is very, very concerning. And I, and I don't need to tell you why. From a um, anecdotal perspective, which is important, we have to factor that in as well. And that speaks to that low savings rate that I showed you here a minute ago as well. Okay, so um, just to sum it up, um, the economy by our assessment continues to deteriorate. And that's something that uh, we think ultimately weighs heavy on stocks in the first half of next year, probably. That's where probabilities point. However, in the meantime, as weaker data shows up, market loves it because it thinks that means the Fed's gonna you know, ease up on hikes, true, but it also means corporate earnings are probably going to disappoint to the downside. So we think that's what makes for at least a test of our 3,500 target, which we hit back in October. But again, as I keep saying, in a recessionary scenario, we've got to be looking at something between 3,000 and 3,500. We haven't yet technically established where that target might be. And then speaking of stocks, folks, I'll do this quick. I've taken more time than I expected here, but there's, here's that daily Look, one year daily chart, very, very busy. We've got it very marked up. But as you can see, um, day before yesterday, went through that 200 day moving average, which has been resistance, you know, went through it here back in the spring and then lost it. Um, didn't even get through it here when we peaked in August, but we peaked right where the downtrend line and the 200 day came together. Um, it's just ramped up through with momentum through these this double Fibonacci resistance came through hit and then and then pounded through the 200 day but then lost it at the downtrend but then the 200 day was support today the 200 day is looking like resistance so we'll see how uh, how today finishes up but if we don't um, get back above that that's going to be a, a very negative technical sign still have our rally up trend line here to contend with, have a beautiful looking 20 day moving average and the 50 day moving average is starting to look up as well. So uh, like I said last time, the technicals look suspect, um, but you know, things can go either way, but I see a lot of uh, upside resistance here. We may have seen the best that we will see here in the Q4 rally. I don't know that that's the case. I, like I said the other day, that 41.50, in this case, 41.60, particularly on the weekly chart, looks like something will be very tough to surmount. Uh, you know, 4,200 is doable as well if we do this with some momentum and some short covering and so on. So all of that remains to be seen. We'll take a look at the hourly chart as we usually do, and then I'll let you go. So on the uh, hourly chart, again, broke out of that, which we should have because we had bearish divergence on the RSI, right? And then here we are, um, you know, bouncing back up as I just showed you on the daily. And then, you know, here we go, however you want it, whatever you want to call that, you could actually call that a bull pennant, although the flag's a little too long there. 
But then, as you can see, things were beginning to roll over here on the MACD, really rolling over on the RSI amid this attempt at a higher high. Gap down today, and then just kind of bouncing around right above what has been support and resistance of late. Break down through there, that 4,040, mark. And uh, this is looking like, at least on the short-term chart, that that's what's destined to happen. And then probably, you know, bouncing up against that. Our consultants in the option space actually have a little different take. They say the way positioning is, barring any big exogenous information that could send the market notably lower, and then you get through some levels, and then it could be very precipitous to the downside. Absent something like that, maybe that happened to be today's jobs number. But if not, if the market holds up against that, they think we actually continue to grind a little higher, as high as 4,200 into December 16th options expiration, which is the biggest of the year. And that opens some doors, uh, perhaps lower after that. But again, that's not necessarily the case that it has to be lower. But when we look at the general conditions backdrop, weakening economic conditions against the Fed that is concerned with things like, you know, wage increases. And then, you know, in the same presentation, I talked about folks hitting their 401ks with hardship withdrawals. Wow, what a mixed picture. But clearly from an economic standpoint, arrows are pointing lower, notwithstanding the still pretty good looking jobs market, at least as it reflected in the wage data. I'll leave it there, folks. Thank you for hanging in there. And hope you have a wonderful weekend. Talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.